This has uh, been a, a great uh, year for us here uh, at Cornell and in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of IP Cal's and um, Sarah and Ronnie and the entire uh, IP Cal staff has uh, put together so many interesting panels and discussions over the course of the year, and we've covered so much. Um, We've covered issues related to gender in agricultural uh, development, uh, biotechnology, e-learning, uh, capacity building, uh, partnerships with international agricultural research centers, um, and uh, how uh, Cornell researchers can respond to food security challenges. All of those topics, and even more, uh, we've talked about uh, in the course of the year. And one of the things that uh, has come up in all of this is the issue of funding and where the funding is supposed to go come from uh, and for what and how it's supposed to be administered. And so this session today in funding uh, engagement in international agriculture research uh, is uh, really kind of a, a central topic that we have to deal with. I was so interested this morning uh, when Dr. Curry spoke at the beginning, right away uh, the issue of funding came up. In the last panel, uh, uh, Dr. Murano started with the question of funding, and then the others leaped right on, and then that became an important theme. And I thought they were going to steal our thunder, actually. I was a little worried about that uh, at the beginning. But I think we have time now to talk about this a little bit more in depth, uh, some of the funding issues. And I, I think in the course of the year, we've had a number of issues come up uh, Dr. Erbau mentioned earlier this morning uh, institutional uh, uh, capacity building and human capacity building. These are two things that are very important. Uh, there's the issue of the lack of in uh, institutional capacity in developing countries. We know so much about scientists that have been trained here in state-of-the-art technology and go back to their countries and that very often are lacking the resources and the facilities to do the kind of cutting edge research that they want to do. When I was thinking about this session, I, was, I thought about one of our bright young women scientists who earned her PhD here some years ago and went back to her country uh, to begin work. And uh, she was shown to, it was a, in the National Agricultural Research uh, Organization, and she was shown to her work site, uh, she was shown the office, the desk, the pencil and the pad of paper, and it's not, it's not a joke, and, it, and she was crestfallen. And so we have the question here now with this kind of institutional capacity not being there, uh, whether um, the scientists uh, are able to reach even a, a portion of their capacity, uh, whether uh, they become complacent uh, in working in this kind of environment, or whether they decide to jump ship and come back here or to another country where they could do their work better. So there's the question of the institutional capacity, and hopefully we'll come to this a little bit. Is there, uh, what, is this an issue that we should be focusing on? And if so, uh, what can the donor uh, agencies do to uh, work with, with us on that? Uh, Dr. Erba also mentioned, as I just said, the question of uh, uh, human capacity building. And you know, that's been a big issue, a big uh, uh, focus for many years. The Rockefeller uh, Foundation, worked heavily on that, many others, uh, and uh, to great effect, actually. Uh, a lot has been done, and some people would say, well, now uh, the capacity is there, the human capacity is there in, uh, in developing countries. Should we really still be focusing on that? And so I think that's a, that's a question. Um, uh, is, is this uh, is something that uh, we should continue to focus our energies on? Uh, so I think one of the things hopefully we'll be able to talk to, is this still a priority? And if so, uh, what can uh, donors uh, do uh, to help uh, us continue in that task of institutional capacity building? Uh, related to this, of course, is the question of, um, of the model for training scientists. If there really is more capacity uh, in developing countries uh, for scientific uh, work, uh, should we uh, be focusing on in-country training or is out-of-country training like coming to the United States to, to study still, still a preferred model? Certainly in-country training uh, offers the possibility of reducing the possibilities of dra brain drain. Uh, 
it keeps the people there. Uh, it also helps the scientists to, to work within the resources and, and institutional capacity that's uh, in that place without having exaggerated um, expectations. Uh, on the other hand, out-of-country training is important for, if for no other reason, and Dr. Johnson mentioned this earlier today, if for no other reason than the network building uh, that goes on and the sharing that's facilitated uh, in the long run in, in the area of international agricultural uh, development. And finally, uh, or almost finally, uh, try, uh, we're talk we talked about partnerships this morning, uh, and we've talked about partnerships all through the year. Uh, Dr. Kaufman mentioned those, uh, Dr. Murano, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lohenberg uh, uh, also uh, mentioned the question of partnerships and how we do this. And we've talked this year here at, at Cornell uh, the partnerships between U.S. universities, uh, the international agricultural research centers, and then the host governments uh, as being important uh, actors in all of that. And then I think one, one of the things that came out of the session this morning was also, well, what about the corporate connection in the private sector? Well, how can we effectively partner with them? And so the question, one of the questions we might be able to talk about a little bit this morning is kind of uh, how uh, can funders help build bridges uh, between those partners, how can they help uh, encourage those types of partnerships? And finally, uh, one thing that I think uh, lurks behind all the decisions of, of funding is the, uh, the changes that have happened in the kind of funding uh, that goes on. Uh, you know, we hark back to the early years of agricultural development uh, a half century ago when I, uh, IP Cal started and the big institutional capacity building efforts uh, that went on there. And then we see in the 90s, we start to see a shift into kind of much smaller scale types of work. And indeed, the panel talked about some of this earlier today. Uh, so I guess one of the questions will be, uh, what's on the horizon for future uh, funding and so forth? And so hopefully, we, hopefully we'll be able to touch on some of those topics uh, this morning in the course of this discussion. What we have in mind is that we will uh, begin and let the speakers address uh, the issues of uh, funding international uh, engagement and agricultural development. Uh, and then uh, we'll uh, have kind of a question and answer session here, a panel discussion. And then uh, after some time, we'll open it up uh, to the floor for all of you to ask questions. So um, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Nikita Erickson Hamill. He is uh, Acting Deputy Director of Global Food Security Policy uh, at Foreign Affairs, Trade, and Development Canada. In this role, uh, he led the development of Canada's international food security strategy and in shaping some of Canada's major food security initiatives. Uh, his responsibility is to improve the coordination of food security programs, especially around agricultural development, and to provide overall policy guidance to improve the effectiveness and coherence of food security programs at the department. Nikita is also a co-chair of the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development, and in this role fosters the strategic coordination of donors around pro uh, priority topics in agriculture, food security, and nutrition. Before joining the public service, Dr. Erickson Hamill worked as a consultant in the private sector and in academia on environmental and agricultural projects in, the country, in countries throughout Asia and Africa. He has a background in environmental engineering, ecological agriculture, and soil sciences, uh, science from the University of Waterloo, Wageningen University, and McGill University. So it's with great pleasure that I uh, welcome Nikita. So um, thank you very much, Max, for that introduction. Uh, and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, it's, uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's not very often that we get uh, an opportunity to come south of the border uh, for these types of events. Um, although I think, uh, you know, I recognize I'm the odd one out here. Uh, but I think I actually had to tra travel the least distance. Um, <laughs> Ottawa is only about 230 miles away. Uh, so the, the border actually does create an artificial uh, divide between our countries sometimes. Um, 
but sometimes there might be a natural divide because I came from a foot of snow in Ottawa, so. Um, <laughs> but um, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here today, I don't have much time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get right into it. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you a bit about sort of our policy framework that guides our programming and um, give you a flavor of how the Government of Canada supports uh, universities uh, to engage internationally in agriculture. Um, is this the slide? There you go. Uh, so very briefly, Canada's international development assistance has five thematic priorities. Uh, sustainable economic growth, children and youth, advancing democracy, peace and security, and finally food security, and that's what I work on. Uh, and following the 2007-2008 food price crisis, uh, we developed a food security strategy, and we've been implementing it ever since. And this strategy is fairly simple, and it's about guiding our programs around three pillars. Uh, sustainable agricultural development, to increase the uh, productivity of smallholder farmers. Uh, improving uh, food assistance and nutrition, so uh, improving the consumption of nutritious food by food insecure and food aid dependent populations. And finally, uh, research and development, looking to uh, improve coordination across the research and development value chain to improve agricultural innovation systems. And I think it's this latter pillar that's really gonna be the focus of my talk today. Um, but, but first, I have to flag that we, we, we actually went, uh, we did a bit of a focus exercise about five years ago. And so we don't actually have a specific focus on tertiary agricultural education. So it was kind of difficult for me to come and talk to you guys today. So what I did was I scratched the surface uh, uh, of all of our programming and identified a range of mechanisms in which we support universities to engage internationally. Uh, and a lot of those times, it's in agriculture. So we don't actually specifically target uh, universities to work in agriculture, but it, it happens. And so I'm gonna present to you five different uh, mechanisms very quickly. I think there'll be nothing new here. It's probably something you've, uh, you're very much aware of, and we, we t we've already talked a lot about these different types of approaches today. So the principal mechanism for us is uh, about partnerships between universities. And here it's about partnering a Canadian university with a university in a developing country. Um, it's not about food security, it's about just partnering two universities together. We've used a uh, competitive uh, call for proposals, and the last one that we uh, launched, we supported uh, 17 partnerships uh, between these universities. Um, and by chance, uh, the majority, or very, I think many of these projects, uh, have to do with agriculture. And I think that's a reflection of the importance and strength of agricultural faculties uh, in universities in developing countries. And I just wanted to show you uh, a few examples to give you a flavor of the types of activities that are funding. Uh, we have a project in Cuba, so obviously not a place where I think a lot of American development assistance goes to. Uh, looking at uh, business skill training um, and uh, training farmers to access microcredit. We also have a project in Malawi uh, looking at farmer to farmer training and also helping uh, youth led food processing businesses uh, to be uh, developed. And then we have a project with a Canadian university and a number, three or four universities in Africa, focused in on uh, women's economic empowerment and helping uh, women uh, to grow and process and consume nutritious indigenous foods. So it was an open call, but we were able to fund uh, a range of activities from nutrition to agronomic practices to microcredit and finance. Second mechanism, and I think this plays to the strengths of many universities and something you're very much uh, uh, familiar with is research partnerships. Um, really about linking researchers, uh, Canadian researchers, with researchers in developing countries. Um, and I want to show uh, two mechanisms here. Uh, one is our flagship initiative, the Canadian International Food Security Research Fund, that's being uh, implemented jointly with our sister agency, the International Development Research Centre. It's a $124 million research uh, fund that supports research partnerships of between one and five million per project. Now on the other end of the spectrum, uh, I wanted to highlight this uh, other project. It's, it ended last year, so it's not operational right now, but it was about providing small grants, about 100,000, uh, to link Canadian researchers with researchers in the CGIR system. So in both cases, it was about broadening Canadian research opportunities 
and uh, improving the access of Canadian technologies in developing countries. The third mechanism um, is, is, is a bit different, and it's about, it's about contracting universities to be an implementing or an executing agency for a development project. And we talked a bit about these consulting companies. Um, and, and this is where, uh, I think this is where they would be sort of in competition with them. Um, and there's three broad uh, instruments that I looked at. One is where one of our bilateral programs, so in this case, the Vietnam program, contracts a university to execute and implement um, a development project in support of, uh, to support the government of Vietnam in food safety and food certification pro processes. Um, it's about an $18 million project, I think. The second instrument is a fund that we created, the Canada Fund for African Climate Resilience. Uh, in this case, uh, the funding came from our Fast Start Climate Financing that came out of the Copenhagen Accord. Um, and in this case, we defined the results. We said it's got to be in uh, address climate resilience objectives. And some of the projects that were successful was uh, this project by the Guelph University looking at uh, agroforestry in the uh, DRC. And finally, uh, a much broader uh, pro project, this Partners for Development program. It's, uh, uh, again, a call for proposals open to all Canadian civil society who want to do work in developing countries. Um, and in this case, one of the successful proposals was from a uh, technical college, so not a university, but uh, to provide agribusiness training in Indonesia. Um, and in this case, the technical college had to compete with all of Canadian civil society. So the World Visions, the CARE, the Save the Children's, the Oxfam. Um, and, the, and they were successful. Uh, and again, in this last instrument, we didn't define that it had to be in agriculture. It was just all of development. Um, so you can see in those first three mechanisms, we, 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 we never actually defined you have to be university and work uh, in agricultural development. It was a mix of different objectives. But we do support uh, the engagement of universities uh, internationally. Just quickly to go over these next two um, uh, mechanisms, scholarships and fellowships, I think it's fairly evident. Uh, you can use, uh, they're very flexible. You can di direct them. You can uh, create them for specific objectives of sending Canadians to get international experience abroad or to bring uh, international students over to Canada to, to learn a new skill and uh, um, help them return back to their countries to um, deliver those skills. Um, Again, at the moment, none of our scholarships or fellowships are targeted to agriculture, but it does so happen that um, a lot of them do end up working in agriculture. And finally, just uh, another mechanism about looking at, at youth as, as leaders in developing countries. Um, we have a youth internship program where we fund short periods of work uh, for youth, and most oftentimes it's university students to go and work on a development project or go and work in a university uh, in a developing country. We also have uh, a range of capacity building programs through our provincial and regional councils. And these are things done in Canada to help uh, civil society, and it could be universities, uh, be better at doing development projects. So it's, it's capacity training on how to write a proposal, how to do results-based management. And these types of basic skills you have to learn to, to be a successful implementing agency in international development. So with my last slide, I wanted to just talk a bit about some, some future trends. But I think I need to provide a bit of uh, context. Um, so in, in the past year, we've undergone the, the most significant institutional change in Canadian development assistance for the past 30 or 40 years. Uh, the former Canadian International Development Agency uh, no longer exists, and it's been amalgamated into a new department, uh, Foreign Affairs, Trade, and Development Canada. Um, and, and the objective here is really to bring uh, more coherence to the broad range of Government of Canada tools internationally. So it's diplomatic tools, it's trade tools, and it's development tools. Um, one of the major outcomes of this has been the creation of a, a new global food security division in which I work in. Uh, we're still sorting out and trying to iron out all the, all the details, um, but it's a central hub of all the expertise on agriculture and food security 
uh, and it provides a greater opportunity for thought leadership on this issue. Um, and what it does allow us to do is, is think more strategically about how we engage uh, all the different sets of development actors, including universities, uh, to be better, um, uh, to, to better deliver on not only development objectives, but the broader set of objectives of the Government of Canada. So our foreign policy objectives and our trade objectives. Um, and we, it was alluded to in a few of the presentations this morning, um, we, we can begin to explore how can universities um, promote Canadian values. And I think there are a set of values that are, you know, we share very much with, with the US uh, around democracy, human rights, equality. And I think Philip addressed that, uh, alluded to that this morning. But also our trade objectives. Um, and, uh, and here I'm talking about develop, can universities help us develop uh, and promote science-based regulation and rules-based trade uh, in, in developing countries and open up markets for uh, genetically modified uh, uh, products. And so we alluded to those things this morning, but I think it's, it, that's one of the future directions I think we're, we're gonna start exploring as to can universities help us uh, achieve those broader suite of topics and objectives. Um, I think I'm gonna stop there and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring up some other points maybe in the discussion. Thank you very much, it's a pleasure. One thing I neglected to mention um, was that we have another speaker that will be join, joining us remotely. So you have at the, the empty seat at the end of the row there, that we, we have uh, here LaRue from uh, the National Institute for Food and Agriculture who will join us. But thank you very much, uh, Nikita. That was, that was really a great introduction and a good overview of what you're all up to in, uh, north of the border. And, uh, I, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Joe Using. He's a senior biotechnology advisor at uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development Bureau of Food Security. His responsibilities uh, encompass all USAID-sponsored biotechnology projects globally. Before joining USAID, Dr. Husing spent the majority of his career in the biotechnology industry, primarily at Monsanto Company, where he held positions in gene discovery, intellectual property, and regulatory sciences. As an academic, Dr. Using was formerly director of the Science Project Management and Leadership Program at Webster University, where he trained scientists in project management. As an adjunct associate professor of entomology at Purdue University, he supported biotechnology efforts in the developing world, most notably the BT cow uh, pea project for Africa. Finally, Dr. Using works with academic, regulatory, and industry scientists to develop harmonized regulatory guidelines in the area of non-target organism testing and risk assessment. Uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Using. Well, thank you. It's a, a pleasure to be at uh, Cornell University. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, spend the next seven, eight minutes telling you about the uh, USAID's uh, Feed the Future program, uh, how that came into being broadly, how it's organized. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about the, the, the seven program areas that fall under that banner. And then finally, what you're probably most interested in is how do I get to participate? And I guess green means go. Okay. Uh, the way that the Feed the Future program is organized is there are uh, three general areas. One is to increase agricultural productivity. And as all of you know, and as we've heard this morning, one of the major constraints in the developing world is just simply the productivity levels uh, of various agricultural lands. Uh, we're also interested in transforming the agricultural system. So in, in many cases, the, the systems that are used are archaic and outdated. We'd like to help modernize those. And then finally, we'd like to improve uh, uh, both the nutrition and policy areas uh, ar around agricultural uh, crops. Uh, mostly, I'm going to show you in the next slide, but the, 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 the Feed the Future program targets essentially 19 countries. They're shown in this map. These are the focus countries under the Feed the, the Future uh, program. 
But what I, what I want you to appreciate, there are focus countries and there are aligned countries. So just because there does, your, the, your country of interest doesn't happen to be on this slide doesn't mean that it's not eligible for support by, by USAID, by some mechanism. Okay. The, the broad banner that the, the group works under is the um, FSIC, the, uh, let me see, I don't even know what it's called. F Future Food Security Innovation Center. They, one of the ideas we came up with, and I'm going to try to help you with uh, this morning, is that they changed the name to a lot of these programs. So you'll hear this thing now, the Innovation Centers and Innovation Laboratories. Uh, so that's just kind of the, the, the banners that these things fall under. But the FSIC is, is the uh, structure, the umbrella that will um, orchestrate your involvement with the seven program areas that, that I'm going to talk about. Uh, one of the probably key differences in past programs is that all stakeholders are meant to be targeted with this program. So uh, maybe unlike in the past where this is mostly industry centric, uh, organizations like industry in particular, and as we heard this morning, uh, Jess Lohenberg DeBoer mentioned this, that a number of these products now need to be commercialized, and universities aren't perhaps the best organizations for orchestrating commercialization of, of, of products, whereas private industry is. So they're meant to be involved as well. In addition, one of the things that a, a, a number of different uh, agencies are doing around the world is, is trying to leverage monies uh, from different sources so that there's a, a bigger impact uh, in any of the constraint areas. So the way I've got these slides organized, you'll see there's a number at the top. It's one through seven. There's seven program areas. Each of the slides will look the same, so you'll kind of get the idea. What we do is we outline the challenge. In the next sort of section there in the middle, we'll outline a solution. And then what I've done is I just put, there's just some examples. These are not inclusive of some of the universities and in innovation, they'll be called innovation labs, that are involved uh, in some of these projects. And again, these, these are, are not all all of the laboratories that are involved in this. We just had to you know, put some examples up. For example, the ABSP2 program uh, at Cornell is, is very much part of the biotech efforts that USAID uh, D ha has, but it predated the Feed the Future program. So the first one obviously is cereals. Cereals are important because they're the major uh, part of the calories that, that people consume each day. The biggest issues we probably have with, with uh, uh, cereals is frankly climate besides pests and, and other issues. So the, the program area that is supported here really is looking at in particular participation of industry and as well as uh, academic labs, really in the area of genomics and then biotechnology, really addre to address things like climate change, uh, uh, soil uh, uh, salinity and issues like that. The second program is around uh, legume productivity. One of the big issues with legumes is just to increase their visibility. I, I've worked on cowpea a good part of my career, and I can tell you that most of the world likes to fund cereals, and they don't, they didn't, historically did not like to fund so-called orphan crops like, like cowpeas. Luckily, there's a lot of nutritionists involved now. Uh, in these programs and, and have convinced people that eating a cereal-based diet without any protein is not a particularly good idea. Uh, so one of the things to do in these legume programs is just to increase their, their visibility, but the second is also to create markets and value chains. Uh, it, it, the, the climate issues that I mentioned for cereals are the same issues you also have in legumes, and legumes in many cases are perhaps more sensitive. So some of the solutions beso besides visibility in markets is also around genomics and biotech solutions. The next program area is um, um, uh, protection of animals. Oh, I'm sorry, I got this wrong. Um, program for advanced approaches to combating, uh, combating uh, pests and diseases. And there's really two areas in this. One is the plant side, uh, fungal diseases and things like this. But we also have an animal component to this. We're, we're helping to develop uh, vaccines, et cetera, for certain animal diseases. Safe and nutritious foods, a big uh, 
program area. Uh, you, it doesn't do you a lot of good to produce more produce if, in fact, the produce is contaminated somehow. Many of you know the issues with aflatoxin in grains, uh, a big constraint, which has a se uh, severe impact on uh, pregnant women in, in particular. But other areas we're looking at are, are post-harvest fisheries and uh, irrigation. Sustainable intensification. Uh, the entire idea of modern agriculture is to produce more calories per acre. So we, we're going to have to intensify uh, those efforts and how you do that without destroying the environment, especially in, in areas that are sensitive, is a critical uh, aspect to look at. So under this program area are, are things like irrigation, integrated pest management, and natural resource management. Policy and markets, we heard some of this discussed this morning, especially in the area of biotechnology. If policies are not in place for countries to participate either in the production of a genetically modified crop or the import of that crop, uh, we're, then we're not able to feed people in the manner that we would like to. So in many cases, uh, addressing issues at the policy level are critical. Markets are another one. Uh, it, it doesn't help uh, to produce new crops that cannot be maintained in a sustainable manner, and a sustainable manner is to have some market mechanism for capturing value out of that crop. Uh, the final area is for human and institutional capacity building. Uh, USAID has been involved in this for, for, for many, many years. Uh, some of the focal areas, uh, just to hit on again, that, that were discussed this morning, are particularly uh, targeting women in, in developing countries where they haven't had the opportunity to engage in institutional capacity building uh, that, that uh, say, men have, for, for example. Okay. I just wanted to point out that uh, aid has a long history of being involved in, in human capacity building, uh, having been involved in training over 4,000 scientists over in some 130 different countries. We continue to do that, and that's not going to change. Okay, if you want to participate, how can you participate? Uh, at the top, you'll see here, there's a, I ha we have an email address. So we just started this. I, I, I can't tell you if this is going to be successful or not, because we're the folks that got to answer these emails. So please, <laughs> I hope tomorrow I don't get 2,000 emails at this website. But let me, let me tee you up a little bit about this. If you, if you have a question, you want to send something to us, keep it short and sweet. A dissertation probably will not get read, okay? It's probably got to be like less than a page. Uh, we will make every effort to respond to you if we don't send another email because it's just, it's a small office and, and this is an experiment essentially. You can go to the website. The website's pretty well constructed even for somebody like me. I managed to, to, to fumble through the thing. Uh, we had a different team work on this website than the others you've heard about on the news. Uh, so, so it works pretty well. Um, you can go to feed to the website uh, feedthefuture.gov, and it's, this is all spelled out there uh, pretty nicely. In addition, each of those innovation labs that I mentioned that are being funded also will be subcontracting work to different uh, institutions and universities. Uh, just be aware that not all of them have their website set up. So you, if there's a program area that you notice that you would be interested in, like legumes, you saw the innovation lab and you go to them, it might not be a, a, a seamless interaction with those folks. You may actually have to give them a phone call or something until they're up and running. And thank you. I think we're going to set up a little break this afternoon. If you want to send Joe an email, there'll be some time to do it later on today. <laughs> well, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome back to campus uh, Kathy Kahn. Uh, Kathy is Senior Program Officer in the Agricultural Development Group at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where she has worked since 2007. She manages grants focused on crop improvement and discovery research addressing the needs of smallholder farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. This includes partnerships supporting innovation across crops, co-funded with the U.S. National Science Foundation, the U.K. Biotechnology and Biological Sciences 
Research Council, and the UK Department for International Development. Kathy trained as a plant pathologist and previously served as an advisor for international agricultural biotechnology issues with the US Department of Agriculture for an Agricultural Service, where she was a diplomacy fellow through the American Association for the Advancement of Science from 2004 to 2006. Kathy has a PhD in molecular biology and biochemistry. Kathy, welcome. Thanks, Max, and thanks very much for the invitation to come here because it's really great to have an excuse to be back um, at Cornell and to be with you all today. So um, I thought I would just give you a little bit of an overview and then happy to discuss more about how we approach working with universities um, for agriculture and life sciences from the Gates Foundation Agricultural Development Program. Um, and I thought I would just start, well, why fund agricultural research? Because, of course, organizations come at this from different perspectives. So with partnerships that we have, say, with NSF, the National Science Foundation, I mean, they actually have a goal to fund scientific research in the United States. That's part of their mandate. But for us at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we're actually not here because we like research and we like universities. Much as we do, we love scientific research. We think it's fantastic. But we fund agriculture because we're focused on farmers um, like this lady who I met a couple of years ago in Tanzania. Um, so this is Christina Mwingepe. She grows cassava about an hour outside of Dar es Salaam. And I happen to have some nice photos of her. Um, so I, I tend to use them. But Christina has, has just has a couple of acres. She grows a lot of cassava, um, some maize and legumes in a mixed cropping system. And she's trying to raise three kids. So you can see two of her younger kids in the background. She has an older son. I'll show you at the end. Um, and the way that she earns income is if she can grow enough cassava, then she'll make chips from it. She'll cut them into thin slices and fry them, and she'll sell them to school kids. Um, and that, that's, that's how she earns income um, when she's able to. But she has a big problem right now, which is that there are some pretty terrible cassava viruses spreading across East Africa, and they happen to be particularly bad in this region of Tanzania. So she's got both cassava brown streak disease and cassava mosaic disease on her farm. And what that means is, that at the moment, she's actually not producing enough to feed her family. Um, she actually has to buy cassava on the market at times from family savings. Um, to be able to feed her kids. And, and that's a huge problem. She's living in a situation, she doesn't have electricity. Um, she's actually quite lucky to be close to a road. But there's a lot of needs that the family has. And I think for myself, if, if I was in that situation, what would I prioritize? I mean, what do you choose you know, when, you, when you're in such a situation? And what she chooses with the money that she gets is she's trying to send her oldest kid to school. And we see this over and over again with these, you know, with these farming women is if the income that she can earn what she would use it for, first of all, the first choice that she makes is getting her oldest son um, in, into boarding school. So we're focused on farmers like Christina because we see that if we can help her produce more, then that is a sustainable and powerful answer to hunger and poverty because she'll be able to create po pathways for herself and for her children um, to escape from poverty and to create a better future. So what we want to do is help her increase her productivity um, by providing her with the tools and opportunities to boost her yield and increase her income. So how do we do that? Obviously, we're sitting in Seattle. Um, we don't do it ourselves. We do it through partners. So we want to invest in innovative solutions all the way from the seed to the market. Um, and that includes a lot of research. We, we want to focus on results and, and build strong partnerships, which is a theme that's come up already. We think about research as for development, as I was saying. We love research, completely fascinating. But how do we translate that research and make sure it gets through to farmers so that it can have an impact on reducing poverty? So how do we work with universities? Um, so I was trying to think through how we work with universities. There's a couple of ways that we do that. One is that we often invite proposals where we see a big need for innovation. So um, unlike a group like the National Science Foundation, we don't do everything by competitive proposals, although we do use that mechanism. Um, but, but we're focused on what do we see as the key needs for these farmers. So one of them I've talked about, increasing productivity. So where are their opportunities to increase yield? 
um, just the yield potential that people can get, but also the yields they actually achieve and how do we help them be more efficient with their, with their inputs. Um, because farmers like Christina don't have much access to fertilizer. So the little that they get, how can they be more efficient? How can we decrease the risks that she faces? So these diseases that cause loss, how can we reduce those? Um, how can we reduce the risk she faces from drought? Um, so that you know, so that she gets a more consistent yield. And then how can we enable improved nutrition for her family? So whether that's adding micronutrients into crops like cassava and maize and, um, and legumes and cereals, um, are there ways that we can help increase the diversity of what she's growing and, and, have, and have food be more affordable? So how do we engage universities in that? So I thought I would give a couple of examples. Well, first of all, to say that, of course, universities are among our key partners. We recognize that we don't do the work, um, that we rely on, on partners to actually implement the work. And universities are among our partners. So um, I'm managing a lot of grants with Cornell, which is why it's always great to be here. Um, you heard about the PICS work, the, the cowpea storage work um, from Jess at Purdue. I also put Illinois up there. We have a recent grant with them on increasing productivity um, through increasing photosynthetic efficiency. Um, but we also work a lot with the International Agricultural Research Centers and national programs in Africa, which I'll talk more about, as well as NGO groups um, like HEFA. And then, of course, we have the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, um, AGRA. And then we have a lot of funding partnerships with other donors. So we have a partnership with the National Science Foundation that um, many universities get involved with, and also in the UK with the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council, BBSRC, and the UK Department for International Development. So there's a lot of different ways um, that we work with universities. And a couple of examples of where we've gone in and said, or we've, is people have come to us and said, here's an important problem. How do we then develop a strategy um, to address that? And one of the examples here is the Durable Rust Resistance in Wheat Project, um, which Ronnie Kaufman mentioned is a partnership of about 20 different institutions, which Cornell facilitates and leads. And this is a multifaceted approach to reduce the risks that wheat farmers face um, with evolving stem rust diseases coming out of East Africa. And so it's a very large collaboration because the problem is so complex. And so this gets to the issue of needing many different partners um, to be able to track what's happening with this pathogen. How's it evolving? How's it changing? How do we find many new genes that can protect um, against the, the losses that it causes and then deliver them to breeders and get them to farmers? And obviously, this is not something that any of us do alone. Um, we're building on a lot of work that USAID has supported. The Canadian government has also supported a lot. And we're co-funding this directly with the UK Department for International Development. And there are many different skill sets involved in the people that actually do the work. Um, similarly, you know, we recognize that access to fertilizers is a huge barrier for smallholder farmers. So we've gone in and said, OK, here's an area that's important to us. And then we'll invite in um, people working in that field. We'll, we'll invite them in and we'll sit down and try to listen to them to say, OK, what are some, what are some interventions that you could envision um, that could make a difference to this? So some of that is just simply improving legume breeding. Um, but some of it is also some cutting edge science where universities are involved. Um, we have a grant, Engineering Nitrogen Symbiosis for Africa, which actually has a pretty good website. That's led by the John Innes Center, but there are universities involved in the US as part of that partnership. University of Wisconsin is involved. Um, University of, oh, well, I think it's in Toulouse, and the University of Aarhus in Denmark are also involved. So these are areas you know, where, where universities play absolutely critical roles in envisioning new approaches, new innovative strategies to address key constraints that farmers are facing. And so we're excited when we have the opportunity to partner like that with universities. And we tend to develop those projects um, after you know, researching among the field who's doing what, who's got innovative ideas. We use peer review just like other funders. Um, and then we negotiate back and forth to figure out you know, what part makes sense for us to, to support, what part makes sense for others to support, and how do we coordinate. So alongside those kind of large projects where we're going in and developing new ideas, we also do, we, we sometimes call it innovation prospecting, which are more competitive grants. So I've mentioned the partnership we have with NSF, the National Science Foundation, um, BREAD, Basic Research to Enable Agricultural Development. And this was, this was a partnership where I appreciated the value of a good acronym. Um, we, did, we did better on this one than, than with some. But, but this is actually a still ongoing partnership where each um, Gates Foundation and NSF both put funds in. 
Um, NSF runs it. Our money goes to NSF. It's an open competition. It's great for US universities because you're all eligible to apply. Um, and then we, from Gates Foundation, we're then able to look at the proposals that come in. NSF makes the decisions on what gets funded, but it gives us a good window into what people are thinking about and, and if there are ideas that NSF isn't able to pick up, we're then sometimes able to develop them. So we actually, Ronnie had mentioned this morning some work on genomic selection. In the first competition, there was um, some very competitive proposals actually from Cornell on genomic selection, one in wheat from Mark Sorrell's group and one in maize from John Luke Janik. And we went ahead and developed them directly. Um, as proposals. So that was one way that we worked together. We, we jokingly called it bread pudding, um, but, but mostly NSF funds the projects. But it's a great way for universities to get engaged because you're all familiar with working with NSF and, um, and you know, it's, it's a nice mechanism for us um, to see what, what universities can offer. Similarly, in the UK, we had a smaller partnership. This was the one we didn't get quite such a good acronym, um, SCIPRID, with the BBSRC. And DFID, and this was a single round um, where they ended up funding 11 projects which involve universities in the UK but also in the US um, and, and, and other regions of Europe. And then finally, we have an in-house mechanism at the Gates Foundation called Grand Challenges Explorations, GCE. And we ran, we've run one topic that a number of universities participated in um, on agriculture, biotic stress, and there are quite a few universities that, that won that. The way it works is you get a two-page proposal you get a it's blind review, um, so we hope people put in crazy ideas that were reviewed without their name attached, and and then they get a hundred thousand dollars, and then they come back after a, between six months to two years to ask for up to a million dollars, um, and so we're quite excited about some of the innovation coming through that. Okay, um, I'm a little aware of time, so I think I'm going to end after this, but. One of the things that we're trying to think about is rather than be focused on um, on working directly with the partners in the you know in the developed world in the U.S., how do we how do we partner more with leaders and emerging leaders in Africa, particularly where we're focused? So I'm I'm quite excited this year that we launched this program for emerging agricultural research leaders. So it's agricultural research for development, and proposals have to be led by scientists working for African national research programs. Um, but they're done in collaboration internationally. So we were trying to change some of the power dynamics to have the focus be more on what does the African partner need and can we help strengthen their capacity um, to take on these kind of projects. It's something that we're running in-house um, and so the research has to align with the strategy of what the Gates Foundation is willing to invest in. We're focused on, an, on a number of staple crops that the most farmers grow um, and several livestock. So the way that we're doing it is a pre-proposal that was three pages that was then we've, um, were then followed by four proposals and then we're offering riding training. Because one of the things we see is that the international partners who aren't used to competing like this. I mean, it was interesting to me on the panel earlier that um, I think it was Dr. Morano was saying how difficult it is sometimes just to be the minor partner, you know, because then the person that's got the grant comes and says, well, this is what we're doing and here's a little bit that you can have to help. And that, that's also the experience of scientists in Africa, right? So they're used to an international partner coming and saying, oh, I've got this grant, you know, it's this many hundreds of thousands of dollars and here's 40,000 for you and please go do this. So they often don't have experience in preparing budgets um, or writing proposals and so we're trying to help Part of this is to build capacity in doing that. Um, we actually closed our first call. We were pretty excited because um, we got 700 submissions. And when we tried to do this with the UK, we actually got seven submissions from the whole of Africa, despite trying. And so we really tried to listen to why weren't African scientists applying, and we spent a lot of time with outreach and, and, and trying to encourage people to apply and trying to keep it simple. And we also offered a couple of... Um, what we called Agricultural Research Connections Workshop that I think a couple of people in the room here have, have come to. Um, and so this was an opportunity for scientists um, anywhere in the world to apply and join us for about, I think it was five days, we did it in Kenya, and to meet with scientists and African national programs and develop research ideas together. Um, and so that has led to some, some strong potential collaborations and, and we're pretty excited about it. But I think I'm gonna end 
there for now, but just to say that as you think about this, I think it's not just about what the, what the US universities need, although of course we recognize that you need funding and you need support, but it's also really thinking about what the partner needs and what can you do in service of, 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 of their needs. And, and sometimes what that means is that really successful projects, um, if you really build capacity, you can actually make yourself irrelevant. Um, and that's true for us too, you know, that we, we want to be such a good partner that we get to the point where we're not needed. Um, and that can be a tough call, but that's my closing thought. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. I, I'm glad you ended on that uh, question about partnerships and the nature of partnerships and uh, how we think about those. And I hope that we can come back maybe when we start to have a little uh, discussion to that topic. Um, next, it's uh, my privilege to introduce uh, Jack Bobo, uh, we've, uh, s some of us uh, were, had the privilege of seeing him yesterday give a great talk. Uh, Ronnie mentioned that earlier today. Um, and he's with us again uh, for this panel. Uh, Jack is Senior Advisor for Biotechnology in the Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. He also serves as the Chief of the Department's Biotechnology and Textile Trade Policy Division. Jack works on trade policy, food security, climate change, and development issues related to agricultural science and technology. Prior to joining the State Department, Jack practiced law in Washington, D.C. His education includes a degree in law, a Master of Science in Environmental Science, as well as degrees in chemistry, biology, and psychology. Previously, Jack received a research fellowship in international law at Cambridge University, England, uh, served as an advisor on the Pref uh, President's Information Technology Advisory Committee and taught science in Central Africa as a Peace Corps volunteer. Let's welcome Jack. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. As you will notice, I've been demoted from doctor to uh, master or lawyer uh, in the course of the day. Uh, I have to mention that because, of course, my wife, who has a PhD in molecular biology, would have reminded me when I got home anyway. <laughs> it, it's, it's great to be here, and I, I actually asked to speak after a couple of the other speakers because I thought that a lot of the things that I might want to talk about would be addressed, and I thought in many ways it was uh, more, imp more appropriate for USAID to talk about the Feed the Future program, despite the fact that the State Department is also very much involved in that. And some people ask me, what's the difference between uh, USAID and the State Department? And, and I usually say, well, at AID they do things, and at the State Department we talk about doing things. <laughs> and the result is that we don't have a lot of money. Uh, and so while, while it's a pleasure to be up here, um, you know, the, the large budgets that some of these other organizations have just don't really exist at the State Department. And in many ways, we're more of a knowledge organization. And a lot of what we do is we're trying to put people together in order to facilitate the kinds of partnerships and the linkages that will allow people to access the resources to do the kinds of research they want to do. And so in that way, I thought that I'd go through uh, some of the different parts of the State Department that are involved in facilitating these partnerships. Uh, I work in the Economic Bureau, and I'm in the Office of Agriculture and Biotechnology, and our, our entire budget for outreach activities is $500,000. Uh, and, and what we do with that money is we, we send speakers and we send professors and faculty uh, around the world to talk about some of these issues. And so while we're not necessarily creating these programs, it creates an opportunity for university faculty to get out there and be known. And uh, here at Cornell University, uh, we also have a, a program at the State Department called the Jefferson Science Fellows Program, which is for a senior faculty member to have an opportunity to come to the State Department or USAID and learn how policy is made, but also to contribute their scientific expertise to the department. And it, it's actually an honor that Cornell has two uh, Jefferson Science Fellows that are uh, on the faculty here, Dr. Peter Davies and Dr. Cy Rizvi. And so uh, there's an opportunity for the universities to engage with the State Department.
department in that way. And uh, Kathy Kahn is a former AAAS fellow, and science fellows are also at the State Department. So many of your, the students who graduate here will have opportunities to come to U.S. agencies and gain that expertise or understanding of how policy is made, but it's also an opportunity for universities to share their understanding of science and technology with the U.S. government. Um, we think we know a lot, but I think there's a lot more that we can learn. Uh, in addition to the Economic Bureau, there's the uh, Science Advisor to the Secretary of State, and uh, Dr. Koglazer is very much involved in uh, promoting scientific exchanges internationally, and he does that working with the Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science, and they work on science and technology exchanges between countries, and universities are often very much a, a part of those scientific exchanges, because creating an international agreement is one thing, but you really need to create life up for that and that's where universities can then begin to forge their partnerships under the umbrella of these S&T agreements, and then that can sometimes make it easier to access resources from NIH, NSF, and others. And so the State Department can help to identify those programs and help universities to, to plug into those activities that are already taken place. Uh, within the Feed the Future world, our office is certainly very much involved in that, but there's also the Office of Global Food Security at the State Department and the uh, Deputy Coordinator for, uh, uh, for Food Security is also uh, works th uh, at the State Department. And so we're very much involved in the policy making, but all of the money went to AID. And so uh, they, they certainly have a, a leadership role and they're the lead in the U.S. government on the Feed the Future program. Uh, so let's see, a few other things. Uh, certainly you're, you're probably already familiar with the Fulbright program that the State Department uh, manages, and that's an opportunity for students uh, and for faculty to travel overseas, for people from other countries to come to the United States. Uh, there, there aren't nearly as many people that are participating in agriculture as I think there could be and that there should be. And so I think that's a clear opportunity uh, for uh, faculty to, to begin to create these exchanges and create the opportunities for uh, deeper partnerships. Uh, I did a little research and there, uh, there are about 155 countries that have participated in the Fulbright program. The Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs, they do programs in about 160 or more countries and that's a, a huge number of opportunities. There's the Fulbright program, but there's also the International Visitor Program where we'll bring people from other countries and scientists as well to come to the United States. And those are opportunities for people that you might be working with overseas to have an opportunity to come to the United States and travel around the country and visit different research centers, visit U.S. government offices and other things. And so those are things that you can encourage your partners uh, to participate in. And then when they come to the United States to, or, uh, and come to Washington, D.C. To, to reach out to USAID, USDA, and the State Department. Uh, there are other programs. There's an international S&T award, which is for scholarships. It's very limited. There's a Humphrey Fellowship Program for bringing mid-career people to the United States in order to, uh, to do non-degree programs at universities. And there, so there are a variety of ways that you, you can be involved, that the State Department can help. But I'd, I'd just like to end by saying that part of it is just making sure that you, you connect with the State Department. So many uh, universities, they are doing great work and research in other countries overseas, and they never tell the, the embassy what they're doing. Why? Well, they don't need any of the resources of the embassy, and that's fine. You know, it's certainly not necessary. But when you're creating a new program overseas, often you could mention it to the embassy, the ambassador might want to come to a ribbon cutting, and all of a sudden you created a relationship. And then all of a sudden there's a, an opportunity to hear about programs that you might not be aware of. Or if you're thinking of creating a, a program in another country, the embassy is, should be one of the first places you reach out to to say, is this the right place for us to be doing work politically? What's the, the climate like? What are the opportunities? We encourage companies to do the same thing. And it's sort of a, an opportunity for us to give advice to universities and to companies uh, about what the, the investment climate or the research climate, the opportunities are. And so there, there are a number of different things. We're ob obviously, we have a, a business visa office, so if there are challenges that occur for people trying to get b visas coming to the United States, again, there are things that can happen. And so I often tell people that, you know, if you have a problem, you know, you can give me a call. I seldom know the answer, but I often know somebody who knows the answer. And so hopefully this is the beginning of a discussion. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Jack. Um, <clears throat> now joining us remotely from Washington, D.C. is uh, Hiram LaRue. Uh, his colleague, Michael Gere, I think is on the program, but he's not able to join us uh, today. Uh, welcome, Hiram. Uh, Hiram is uh, director of the Center for International Programs in the U.S. Department of Agriculture's National Institute of Food and Agriculture, where he guides international research, extension, and education programs in close collaboration with colleagues from U.S. land-grade colleges and universities. Before he moved to USDA, he served as a policy liaison to the U.S. higher education community for U the U.S. Agency for International Development. During his tenure at USAID, he also helped to develop some of the agency's early integrated pest management activities, contributed to a strategy for USAID's research portfolio, and helped to raise awareness of disability issues overseas. He started his career as a research entomologist with USDA's Agricultural Research Ser Service in Beltsville, Maryland. During his career, he has taken professional staff assignments to the U.S. Senate, the U.S. Department of State, the College of Southern Maryland, the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, join me in welcoming Herm. Thank you, Max. Let me just do a sound check. Can you folks hear me well? Yes, yes. Yeah. Great. Well, let me get started by first thanking Max and thanking Sarah Davidson Ivanega for the invitation uh, to participate. I'm glad that we were able to arrange the electrons such that we can join you by DBC. This is the kind of the way of the future, I think, and so it's kind of neat that we're using this technology. Mike McGurr is out with a bad chest cold, and so he called in this morning with strong regrets not, about not being able to join uh, the conference today, and I'm sure that uh, he'll be interested in hearing what is discussed. Um, certainly the panel that has um, spoken here in this session has done a terrific job of profiling a number of key opportunities and programs. What I thought I might do is take the opportunity presented by the 50th anniversary of Cornell's involvement internationally to reflect a little bit. I always see these kind of signal anniversaries as a chance to look back and look forward, obviously, and pause for just a moment and kind of see how things are going. In my mind, you may not agree, but in my mind, I think, in terms of the interest in global engagement, we're at a little bit of a watershed moment. Uh, and I mean by that, that while we fully respect and appreciate and celebrate uh, all of the good work that universities, U.S. and others, have done overseas to assist overseas uh, colleagues to help build capacity, both human and institutional, to further the science, and uh, perhaps even to extend it out in the fields. For all of that work overseas, we're more fully appreciating these days that we also have a stake here in the U.S. in globally engaging our science, our classrooms, our outreach extension systems increasingly depend on globally engaged faculty, staff, and students. And so I, I believe that it's a, as I say, a bit of a watershed moment um, that institutions like Cornell have played and will continue to play a significant and key role in. The reason, one of the reasons I think I've come to this notion that we have as much at stake as we have to share here in the U.S. is because I work for a part of the U.S. government, U.S. Department of Agriculture, that is a domestically focused agency. We provide more than a billion dollars a year to the U.S. community of universities to strengthen their agricultural outreach programs through extension, their teaching programs, and of course their science research programs, all with a focus on strengthening American agriculture through those investments. Increasingly, however, we're realizing and appreciating the fact 
that we can only do that kind of strengthening to the extent that we're able to engage globally. And so we're, we're working to try to support global engagement in ways that are increasingly mutually beneficial. So let me say just in a couple of specific, uh, provide a couple of specific examples of what we do. That NIFA uses basically kind of two tracks uh, to support global engagement. The first is that we use our own NIFA resources, those that are provided to us by Congress, and our own authorities, legal permissions provided by Congress, to support global engagement. We have, for example, in recent years, used a modest amount of resources to what I call jumpstart or kickstart work to promote the globalization of U.S. extension, mainly because we understand that with the demographic shifts in the U.S., our extension system is increasingly being asked to serve the needs of a diverse, more and more diverse clientele in this country. And in order for our agents and experts in the extension system to respond accordingly, they need the cultural uh, connections, the cultural sensitivities that can often come through global engagement. We also here at NIFA use our own resources to provide competitive, a competitive grant uh, program that has for several years focused on the praxis of globalization and how can we best learn from globalizing, how best to do it in a way that maximizes benefits back in American classrooms, American extension offices, and American research benches. It's called the International Science and Education Competitive Grants Program. Many of you know it. Unfortunately, it hasn't been funded recently, but I still believe that there is critical need and role for a program that studies the process of globalization and its impacts here at home. And lastly, in terms of our own resources at NIFA, NIFA has a huge portfolio of competitive and non-competitive programs that it runs to support work in areas as diverse as youth development, climate change, uh, animal and plant productivity and protection, soil health, water management, high tech, including biotech, nanotech, and robotics, uh, sustainability, agricultural sustainability, human and animal nutrition, of course, food safety. And we also have programs specifically designed to strengthen the curriculum, the pedagogy in US classrooms. So in all of those programs, what we have tried to do here in NEPA is wedge open a space within them that allows the uh, colleagues who are implementing those programs at universities to partner internationally. And the way we've been able to create that space is to make the argument that through such partnerships, our scientists can bring back to our classrooms, our extension systems and offices, and our research benches uh, insights that they would not have otherwise had. Second way that um, NIFA is engaged globally is by using resources to grow up that are provided to us by other parts of the federal government, such as AID, State Department, MCC, and the like. Um, and we use those funds uh, and the authorities that come with them to engage uh, land grant and other university colleagues here in this country to help implement programs overseas. We've been in that business for more than 30 years, uh, starting with a very, um, I think, effective program in, that started, I believe, in 1990 to enhance and strengthen and actually create, in some cases, an extension system in Poland. Uh, we, through that process, engaged more than 30 land grants, and the proof is in the pudding. The Polish extension system these days is one of the stronger within the bloc of the former Soviet Union countries. It has all sorts of, um, what would you say, success stories to uh, claim for the, the power that that extension system has enabled and provided to Polish agriculture. 
As a domestic agency, we continue to really value, in fact, we have consistently valued what university faculty, staff, and students bring back to their classrooms, their research facilities, and their ex communities through extension because of their work overseas. But let me end by making just a couple of final observations and points. One is that until international development is perceived as a really integral part, as a significant part of our own progress here in the US as a society, until we get it that we depend as much on our colleagues around the world as they depend on us, then it's going to be a hard sell to promote the notion of global engagement on the Hill, in government agencies, in universities, uh, and generally amongst the public at large. I think we've got a wonderful story to tell. I think we could tell it more effectively. And this is my last point. I think universities have a key role to play in helping us make the case that they are as dependent uh, in that global engagement in, for improvement. They look to that global engagement for a way to improve their programs and strengthen American agriculture as a result, as they do have to offer overseas. And my sense is that the universities have a, a lot that they could help us with in terms of learning how to effectively global engage to maximize that mutual benefit. With that, Max, I'll stop. And thank you very much again for this opportunity. Thanks, Aram. That worked really well, by the way. Uh, yeah, I think you came across loud and clear, so that's nice that uh, that worked so well. So um, I'm a little mindful of the time, and I, I look. Some people look very hungry. I, I think, but we're not. That doesn't mean we're going to end right now. But what I wa would like to do is kind of. Uh, give us enough time to just engage with the panelists for a few minutes. So if you're interested in ra answer, uh, asking a question, if you could get near the microphone, that'll signal to me that you want to ask a question. And I'll come back to you. Uh, Randy, I see you already. I, I, but, I, but I will take the, the privilege of asking the first question. And that, I want to come back to the partnership uh, issue. Uh, that, uh, well, Hiram was speaking to that just now, and all of you have talked to that in one way or another. Um, and one of the themes that we had this morning early on, already from Dr. Curry's uh, presentation at the beginning, was kind of the, 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 uh, the uh, mission of universities uh, like Cornell and other partners that are here uh, is to provide uh, leading edge uh, knowledge uh, in the service of development and helping people around the world, especially poor people. Uh, to do that, uh, it seems apparent from the discussions that we've had today, that partnerships are important. So my question uh, to the panel is, uh, in terms of uh, promoting partnerships, and those could be partnerships uh, with other universities, uh, partnerships with the private sector, NGOs, et cetera, uh, what kind of strategic investments in the interest of partnership development uh, can be made? Um, and I, it, would anybody like to jump in? Kathy, maybe you want to take the lead on that? Sure, I could jump in. Um, I mean, so a couple of, I mean, maybe they're small things, but one thing we've seen is that giving people a chance to meet together in person when they're developing a proposal is so important because it just really improves the quality of, of how folks work together. Um, I also think that you know, this point came up in the earlier discussions, I think Ronnie made it and probably someone else too, about the recognizing where your strength is and, and your value is. So it doesn't make sense, say on the wheat rust project, Cornell is not the partner who's going to be actually growing the wheat plants in Ethiopia and multiplying them and getting them out to farmers, but has really enabled the partnership with the Ethiopian Institute for Agricultural Research, who does that. So recognizing what each partner brings to the table and what their comparative strengths are. And then I think a willingness um, to engage in, in in sort of facilitative leadership or servant leadership, that it's not about you as the university, but trying to give credit to the partners and have the focus on the problem and on the farmers that we're trying to help. I think the more that we see that, that it's not about me, you know, it's really 
about you, you know, and it's about the poverty that we're trying to reduce or the mission that we're trying to accomplish. I've seen that really enable partnerships. Um, and I think just on a practical level, you know, the, I think, um, well, Professor Hurry raised the question this morning, well, like, where's the next Ronnie Kaufman? And I, I, I think it also comes to people's recognizing what their strengths and what they bring to it. So often I work with, you know, really leading edge cutting scientists who, who just love to do the research and to work in the lab and train students um, and to teach. And someone like that, you want to keep them doing that. Right? But to engage in partnerships then, you really need that role of the project management. And so that's why I think, you know, we've asked that question too, well, like, where's the next Ronnie Kaufman coming from? And he assures me he's considering himself mid-career award stage at the moment, <laughs> which, is, which is fantastic. But we've been worried about it as well, and so that's why it's really important having folks like Sarah, um, you know, Sarah Davis and Ivan Egger here, um, as well as um, folks like Hallie Tufan, who we've specifically put on projects full time to say, here's the opportunity to be mentored, to learn how to do this. And it's such an important role, and it's often underappreciated by the hardcore scientists, but yet we want the hardcore scientists to stay the hardcore scientists and to do what they do really well, and we want to facilitate and enable it. And I think for these partnerships, having that role of, of management and enabling is, is really important. So. One of the wonderful things that Ronnie does for us here at Cornell and people like myself is help us to continue to feel young. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Kathy. Nikita, I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, on this question and, and from the Canadian perspective, perhaps. Um, yeah, I, I, was, I was just reflecting. I, I mean, very similar points to, to Kathy. Um, in our one research uh, fund, the Canadian International Food Security Research Fund, we've had a lot of success with uh, providing that seed funding. It's about 10 or 20K to allow these partnerships to get together and over six to eight months develop a, you know, a proper proposal and then it can be evaluated competitively. So it's, 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 you, sometimes you just need that, that seed funding to bring people together. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think again, you know, echoing some of Kathy's comments, uh, recognizing your value added, um, that universities may not have the monopoly on, on, on teaching, education, training, research and extension. Uh, there's a range of other actors that could do it better. Um, and, you know, humility, you might not be the, the principal partner in a development project. You might be the secondary or the tertiary partner. Uh, and I think that's important to, to recognize. Um, also, I, I mean, I'd like to be sort of provocative because none of you are going to approach me for funding. So um, <laughs> I, to kind of flip the equation, and, and we, we've, we've explored a, a different model, and that's providing core budget support to the... Uh, to various governments. And one of them is, is the Ministry of Agriculture of Ghana. Uh, it's, it's significant, don't quote me, it's in the order of 150 million over uh, a number of years. And so we're funding their core budget of the ministry, of which a flow through of about 10% goes to the Agricultural Research Council of the government of Ghana. And so instead of money flowing from our domestic research councils to our universities, to do international development, we're giving the money to the Ghanaians. We're asking them to, to pick winners and, and to find the partners that they want. And so it's kind of a, a bottom-up approach. And so they'll use that money to reach up and identify who they want. And it's not sort of that reverse process of them having to come and identify, you know, the best universities in the north who have the money. It's, it's all of a sudden, they're, in, they're the ones with the money and they, they look for the expertise. So it's a different angle on, on, uh, on those types of partnerships. Yeah, that'll be really interesting to see kind of uh, down the road to evaluate a little bit about how, how that, that reverse uh, funding has worked. Uh, Joe, would you like to add anything on, on that topic? Uh, sure. Just to kind of follow up and reinforce what everybody else has said, uh, the, the point about knowing what your strengths are is an important one, but it's just as equally important that you know what you can't do. And, 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 and all of us that have come out of the academic world, uh, uh, we spent our entire life having challenges thrown in front of us that we somehow overcame. And, and many times we forgot to just be able to step back and say, you know what, I really don't know how to do that. Or there's somebody else that can do that better. And that's particularly important when you start talking about these partnerships, because you get into a whole area that requires some amount of management, project management, whatever you want to call it, and, and a lot of scientists, frankly, just don't like doing that. 
they like being at the bench or, or, or making their discoveries and things. So, so it requires a, a, a level of management sometimes that people aren't used to and they don't like, but they have to address nonetheless. And, and increasingly, that's spilling over into the area of metrics, right? Because people, they, they want to measure what you're pro, uh, how productive you were. Uh, you know, AIDS just uh, started this whole new program of measuring productivity, and it, it, it can drive a lot of people crazy. Uh, the second part of that, I think, is understanding what the, what the missions and constraints are of the various institutions that sit at the table. Uh, you know, a, a business has a different mission and constraints than a university does, and then different universities have different constraints. And understanding what each of those uh, constraints are and what the reward systems are within those various institutions is important. People tend to participate better if they get rewarded than, than, than if they don't. And then finally, kind of go full circle uh, with this. I think uh, someone mentioned this this morning. Um, it, academic institutions evolve slowly because they're very successful. But, but one of the areas, uh, the so-called silo mentality sometimes that you, that you have. I, I was just at a, a, at a meeting a couple weeks ago. Uh, 30, 40 scientists, great thinkers from all over the world, absolutely great project. You know what they needed more than anything else? They needed to have an MBA sit down with them and spend an afternoon and write a business plan, and they would have gotten funding easily. Great ideas, but they didn't know how to articulate that into the selling points like a business would if they were going to go sell it to somebody. The business school is a good group of people to get to know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hiram, any, anything to add from Washington on, on that topic? My only other comment would be, as NIFA has kind of looked at its portfolio and asked the question, okay, to advance it, i.e. to kind of advance the cause of U.S. agriculture, what are the key partners internationally that we need to be looking at according? And uh, make a long story short, we just signed an MOU with BARD, with the Binational Ag and Research Development fund with Israel. And so we anticipate that through that partnership we'll be able to, uh, again, in a mutually beneficial way, uh, strengthen work, for example, in water management, an increasingly important field of study and work here in the U.S. The Israelis have a great, great amount of science and technology uh, know-how and expertise to offer in that realm. So to us, partnerships are strategic and are key. We'll take a couple of quick questions from the floor. So, uh, Randy, you want to start? Yeah. Uh, I don't know how I can be quick, but anyway, uh, <laughs> I've been around for a long time, and uh, uh, I should say about 50 years, I've been in and out of uh, Cornell and the International Rice Research Institute. So I'm mostly down at the farm level which I liked, at least Catherine mentioned the farm. That's what she at least said we were doing something about the farm. But the point is this, that uh, when you get to be emeritus, uh, you can say what you think, because nobody's paying you. Uh, and uh, what I think, I have four different categories. One is capacity building. Why is Ronnie successful? Everybody says, well, we've got to find a new Ronnie. The one thing about Ronnie that I like is he always answers his email. And he tells you where he is. And I like that. You know, he's in, he, I just got one from Saskatoon. Oh, you know, or, or Kabul, something like that. Anyway, but the other thing is that Ronnie knows that he stays as far away as he can from your office. Because uh, he, he knows that he has to get the top scientists in the team. And, and okay, so it's wheat rust now. Let's get the best 20 scientists in wheat rust to work on this. And let's, if you try to get you know, the international centers to work together, no. Uh, the university to work together, well, it's hard. And, but that's why I think Ronnie's successful. Of course, he also was uh, Norm Borlaug's only student, and he has Bob Hurt to get him out of the bail if he has to do something with <laughs> economics. Okay, <laughs> so that, that's for him. Now, uh, I think that capacity building. Everybody's mentioned capacity building. When I started off, I, in the 70s and 80s, I ran my whole program out of 
USA 211D grants. The 211D grant allowed me to fund my graduate student to send him overseas and to fund me to find out what he was doing. Salary recovery for going overseas. Can you imagine what a wonderful day that was? A long time ago. Now, suddenly, I think USAID is beginning to say maybe we should be doing capacity building. I think Gates hasn't yet discovered the importance of capacity building, as near as I can figure out. Uh, now, let me tell you what USAID and Gates do. You see, there are different donors. The best donor, in my view, is the Australians, because they know something about agriculture, ACIAR. And, and we got a small grant from them, and we can do something. Gates, USAID, $20 million. You see, they give $20 million to Erie uh, for something called South uh, CISA, which, uh, and uh, I, I guess the only thing I would say is that my friend Bob Hurt wrote the proposal, told Gates not to fund it, but they funded it. But what you do is you do three years, you write a proposal for three years, and in order to ha say that you've had an impact, like how many people you've lifted out of poverty, you have to hire an impact assessor who writes the story. And then you can get another three years. And I told Prabhu they never should have given us the first three years, and now they've given us another three. And now you've got $20 million there, and here comes USAID, and the USA says, oh, Gates knows what they're doing, Erie knows what they're doing, we'll give them another 20 million. And that's what's happening down at the ground. Now, how can we break that cycle? Because I don't think you can make much progress with that kind of structure where you've got, you know, now come back to Cornell. Silos, disciplinary silos. You know, if I'm, a, if I'm in economics or ag economics, uh, I can't afford to do, inter problems are interdisciplinary. Water management is interdisciplinary. You can't afford to do interdisciplinary research if you're going to get tenure. You start off and you, you now have uh, a thesis with three uh, journal articles. And then after that, you write more journal articles. It's of course nobody reads. But anyway, uh, you keep doing these. And then finally, you get tenure, you're, you're exhausted. And then, then you can do interdisciplinary research. <laughs> And I spent my life doing interdisciplinary research. That's, that's why you've never heard of me. <laughs> okay. I think I've said enough. All right. <laughs> Th thanks, Randy. Did you want to comment? Yeah, uh, sure Kathy would like in. to say something so, real quick, and then we'll go for another. Well, so thanks for your honesty, because like, it's actually quite hard for us to get you know, decent feedback, because one of the problems about being a donor is that people tell you what they think you want to hear the whole time. Um, and that's part of partnership too, right, is you need, on, you need honest feedback. So uh, what I would say is that you know, the projects that we support var vary in quality. You know, some, of them, some of them are much more successful than others. And, uh, I, think, and I think we'll fail. If, if, we, if we only fund safe, successful projects, then for sure we'll fail, right? <laughs> well, I, I mean, the wheat rust project is five years. Sure, sure. And I mean, yeah. Fair enough. I mean, okay. So, so give me a chance to respond. So, one thing that I would say is that um, none of just like people have to figure out where their sweets what is and where they add value we have to think that too so although yeah we have a lot of money but we think that we think from the gates foundation that we're going to fund two to three percent of what's needed for african agricultural development annually we actually think that we're a small part of the overall solution okay and it's easy to get that out of perspective just because of the attention that we get even even with, like when we announced the wheat rust project i mean i went along to to Oblegon, but I wasn't even sitting at the front. I wasn't even talking about it. No one else was there from the Gates Foundation, but you look at the headlines, oh, Bill Gates announces. You know, it was like, actually, no, like it wasn't. So we do get a lot of attention and we want to use that voice, you know, effectively to help, because let's face it, agricultural research is grossly underfunded, right? It's absolutely underfunded. So what I would say on the capacity building is that, um, that I, I mean, I agree that it's very important. It's like, but it's not our major focus as a donor to say that we're going to go in and we don't look at the end of a project and say, 
um, you know, how many institutions were built, or we rely a lot on the partnerships with others. So we have we have benefited so much the projects that we support from capacity building that say Rockefeller Foundation did, or that USAID did. Like I say, we think we're two to three percent of the total of the total of what's needed. So we can't do it all. Now we do do capacity building within projects, and it's something I've been trying to push a lot harder. And so that's why with this program for emerging agricultural research leaders, a big emphasis on that is capacity building, right? Because they're going to be led by national agricultural research system scientists, and as part of part of their process, as we're trying to strengthen their capacity as they as they apply, you know. So it's so it's a mixed bag. But, but, but what we try to do is like you, you want to keep growing and learning and getting better at it, and it's a complicated, it's a complicated dynamic, mm -hmm. right? And so there's mm -hmm. lots of different pieces to that, and, you know, and hopefully we'll keep getting better at it, but we're, ne we're never going to do it alone. So. Yeah, very, very, very interesting. We, well, you know, he, uh, Hiram's going to speak up and give me a signal if he wants to uh, say something. <laughs> So I don't know if you heard that, Aaron. Uh, and I'm ha I'm happy to comment, but maybe in the interest of time, happy to if uh, somebody could give the gentleman my phone number and or email, I'm happy to visit with him. Uh, about that at length. I'd love to hear his insights as well. That, that's, a, that's a great idea. So in the interest of time, uh, we have a couple more questions. Uh, I want you guys to have a chance. And so uh, would you both just uh, uh, in turn uh, uh, give us your questions and then the panel could mull that over and then we'll end on that. Well, uh, Hussein al nashar I'm, I'm a, an independent consultant out of Oregon State. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, hopefully I'm politically correct because nobody pays my salary either, but uh, <laughs> uh, the, the question that bothers me a lot is, has to do with uh, the U.S. Uh, as a government, and that's uh, probably directed to people who work in the government, member of the panel and probably beyond. Uh, we find ourselves often jumping into a country that has a boiling turmoil, and we end up spending billions of dollars uh, cause a lot of destructions, uh, leave the, con the country unhappy at the U.S. And, oh, and any American citizen, then we leave. And we keep talking, there's no funds available to fund all these international development programs that we know if we feed the people, all this trouble will defade. So do you guys can have a chance to use this argument to shift some of this uh, budget, government budget, into institutions that could really solve the problem at the bottom. Okay, thank you. And one more question and then we'll... Uh, <clears throat> my name is Hide Imumori, I'm a faculty Hide, member here yeah. at Cornell. Um, my question, I think she, he's almost stole most of my thunder. I wanted to ask a question about capacity building, but from a slightly different angle. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, um, I think most of the capacity for agricultural research in Africa was developed by training a lot of Africans here in the U.S. I, I was born and raised in Nigeria, and almost like 80% of my teachers were trained in the U.S. When I, when I went to college. But I think in the last 25 years, things have kind of changed. And so most of the fund that is going into agricultural research and development, and I think it's, it's already, some of it was already addressed a little bit by, by Kathy, is that we're talking about all these partnerships, doing things in Africa and so on and so forth. Um, as somebody who has lived in the US now for about 20 years, I mean, I came here to do my PhD and in a perfect world, I would have gone back home to Nigeria, but that didn't happen. And the reason was simple. If I went back home, I felt, what will I be doing? What will I be doing, really? You know, what that doesn't run in the lab, no reagent, no, not, I would just, I would probably end up as a businessman or going to politics. And so I think this partnership are having challenges because we really need to direct more specific attention to developing indigenous research capacity not just including them as afterthoughts into projects. I, I appreciate that some of that is happening. 
But I think we need significant things of scale. I don't know if people of the panel have some ideas to share on that. That's great. Thanks, Akiti. Uh, so uh, I think now we'll turn it over to the panel. So I would ask you if you'd like to address the questions that are on the floor, or if you have any other closing comments that you'd like to make, and we'll, we'll finish up with that. And so um, and maybe, Jack, maybe we'll start down at your end. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure that any good can come of <laughs> I'm not sure any good can come of me trying to, to answer directly the, the question you have about the division of where resources go. I mean, I think we all understand that, you know, there are some challenges in different parts of the world and that, you know, resources might be nice to be placed other places, but uh, th there are different silos within the government. And I, I think the main way to address our challenge, though, in development is that we need more resources for development. It doesn't matter what the other money is. We need more for agriculture. And I think if I had a final point was that we need to remind the American people and people everywhere is that for every dollar you invest in agricultural research and development everywhere in the world, you get a positive rate of return. And so, you know, there's really no reason not to do it. And it has nothing to do with alternative uses of funds. It's just a good investment. So. Kathy, yeah. Yeah, so just on the question of building capacity by bringing people to the United States. So, I mean, I, I think we haven't. Not necessarily bringing them here. Maybe sometimes we have to take the knowledge to them. Right, but it, but we're here talking about funding U.S. universities, and U.S. universities like to train students. From, I mean, looking at it from sort of the side of the table where I'm sitting now, it costs at least seventy thousand dollars a year to train a PhD in the United States. It's a whole lot cheaper to do it in Africa. Now, you can argue about like quality and the experience of being on a campus like this, you know, versus depending where you are. But but there's also the, we're thinking a lot about costs. Um, and we, we have to think about costs in terms of the farmers. So, you know, if, if we're investing $10, what's the best way to spend that? And if you could give a farmer like Christina $10, and if she can do more for it than we can do with the $10, then you're better off just giving the farmers the money, right? And that's actually one of the areas that I think the Poverty Action Lab at MIT has looked into from an economics perspective. Like, w we have to show that what we're doing with those dollars is, is is having as much development impact as possible and that and there's competition for them right so so i would just say you know in terms of you know how we think about that that we also have to think about the funds it, you know this is kind of multiple there's multiple ways to think about it um, I completely agree with it, that more support is needed for agriculture. It's a fantastic return on investment in, in benefiting many people's lives. Um, and I also, like, I absolutely hear you on what if you, you know, people need the opportunity, say, to go back to Africa and to be able to, to do their work. And that that's partly why I think we've been trying to invest in this Pearl program is to say that if you get your training overseas, then, you, you know, here's some support to go back. Um, and to set yourself up with the lab. We actually ended up getting very few applicants who wanted to go back. Um, we mostly got applicants who were already based in Africa. Um, but, um, but, but certainly, I mean, just to recognize that it is a complicated problem, that, that you know, we recognize it's difficult and that more support is needed and that more support is needed, you know, for, we need to be as effective as we can with the limited resources that we have. Thanks, Kathy. Joe, you want to give us your thoughts? Sure. You know, I, I think it's easy when you get into these sorts of discussions to, to forget how far we've actually come. And it, it, it's, it's, it's useful to step back and say, you know, the system has been remarkably successful. You know, there's the Brazils of the world now, the Indias, the Chinas. There are dynamic economies that are growing. They're also starting to participate in this process. Those countries now become educators and, and donors, and so that 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 dilutes somewhat probably uh, the role that the land grant universities in the U.S. used to to play because they were kind of the only game in town for an awfully long time. Uh, the second part of that is the dynamics change. So we we now have businesses participating at a in a at a manner that never used to participate. There's the Duponts, the Monsantos, the Pioneers, and so on and so forth. They also are involved in building things like capacity, but in a different way. Um, people that know me will know that capacity is one of those issues. I'm 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 very passionate about because I frankly think uh, people talk themselves in circles because the word means different things to different people. To me, capacity means I've got a job. It doesn't do you any good 
to train a bunch of PhDs and send them back to a country and they can't work. I mean, what good is that? Uh, so, so ultimately, at the end of the day, it's, it's the economic forces, the businesses, et cetera, that are hiring people in countries, employing those people that are the true measure of, of building capacity. I think that's, that's what we need to look at. The good news is probably the countries that were easiest to help have been done. The ones that are, that are left are more, but they're more challenging. But at the end of the day, somebody's got to have a job or they're not going to stay in the country and the country's not going to prosper. Yeah, interesting point, Joe. Uh, Nikita, what about your thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to tie in a few of those questions. Um, starting with capacity building, I think, I think it's a very dangerous slope to go down. I think it's, it's one of those wicked problems in development. We, we all recognize that the, we need capacity development for international development. However, I'm not sure it's the role of development assistance to, to fund it. We, 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 we've tried it for 40 years. It's a broke model. It, it's one of the downfalls of human curiosity that we're never actually satisfied with the knowledge we have. You, know, you guys know it all. We, we, we always want to learn, learn more. And so the, 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 the needs for capacity building are, are expanding uh, exponentially as we become a more educated society like this. And, and the trends for development assistance is in the exact opposite direction. Development assistance, therefore, isn't the source of funds to address something that's increasing exponentially. Um, and, and, and that, I just wanted to sort of bring in, in, in another sort of uh, thought. Um, I've been working with other donors looking at uh, some of the future trends in international development assistance, uh, particularly in the context of the post-2015 development framework that's going to uh, replace or update the uh, Millennium Development Goals. And one of the observations is that the future shape of international development, it'll be shaped by policies and consumption, policies that affect trade, investment, uh, and, and consumption, what we eat how, and how much we eat. But international development assistance will be shaped by shocks. Governments will react to economic shocks, climate shocks, natural disasters, social shocks, basically conflict states, uh, states in protracted crises. Um, and, and so, and then sort of the, 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 the overarching story there is, in the good old days of the 60s and the 70s, when development assistance was a significant portion of a country GDP, when we were 20, 25, 30% of country GDP, we could address things like capacity building. It's hard to find a country now where donor assistance provides more than two or 3% of GDP. And so development assistance needs to be more strategic. It needs to be addressing um, uh, very key pieces of the puzzle that we think can be unlocked and, and allow all the other actors in development uh, to, 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 to achieve and contribute to international development assistance. And here it's about the changing shape of the development community. We've always looked at the private sector, the nonprofit, academics, but if you project forward, institutions are changing. Um, we have private sector now that, that has a strong CSR agenda and are doing nonprofit work, doing development work. We have nonprofit organizations that are now creating shareholder companies and, and selling it to farmers. And, and, and so that fine line between what's nonprofit, what's private sector. And the same thing for universities. I think universities need to reflect on this changing landscape of development community. Um, and, and, and ask yourself, who are universities? You, you are researchers, you are technical laboratory staff, you have youth, you have students, you have administrators. Um, and, and each of those actors can contribute differently to international development. Um, and, and to address sort of that capacity building, I'm trying to draw a bit of a circle here, I think university administrators can offer quite a significant um, contribution to universities in southern, uh, in, in developing countries. And uh, try to show them how to develop sustainable funding sources so that they can, within their budgets, competitively fund uh, um, staff, faculty, uh, and retain them over long term. And so that those university professors in those developing countries, universities, don't have to go and find partnerships to supplement their income. We've talked about partnerships. The partnerships can actually be quite detracting from, uh, from the core work of these southern partners because they rely on you know, ad hoc funding from, from these partnerships to supplement their salary. So I think it's a matter of reflecting on this changing landscape of development assistance um, and the role of partnerships and where the money is going to be coming from. Well, I think you did a good job of shaking things up there. That gives us a lot to talk about at lunch. Now, Hiram, I haven't forgotten about you. You uh, want to comment and have some last uh, thoughts? 
Just one quick point, and that is um, one area that we really haven't touched on, haven't had a chance to touch on during the panel. Uh, as we look ahead, um, is the powerful, incredibly powerful tool that is now available to us that hasn't been uh, in decades past, namely the tool that I represent, my presence there represents today, information technology. Um, not only in terms of what it means to us uh, in delivery of effective programs overseas, but how it can also help us link the lessons learned overseas with the lessons learned here at home. Um, and so I see again a role for universities to play in the study of this particularly powerful tool, IT, and how it can both foster and advance uh, the cause overseas and here at home. Thanks very much, Max. Yeah, thank you, Hiram. So, uh, Sarah, do we have any announcements at this moment? We, we need to be, we, we've, our lunch is a little delayed. We have to be back here at one. We want to stay on schedule, so. Two. I, two, excuse me, two, yeah. I, I knew I was feeling kind of hungry. I'm disoriented. Randy had me, all, Randy threw me off completely, no. Uh, so, uh, back at two, enjoy your lunch. Thank you.